and welcome to How to Pitch Yourself Confidently. This is pretty much the panel where we're going to be talking about pitching and everything that has nothing to do with the actual pitch. If you are interested in watching how to conform your actual pitch, there has been a couple of other panels that have covered that in great detail. Um, earlier in the con, one of them is Pitch uh, Perfect, which I highly recommend. It really does explain and lay out how to do your different types of pitch, uh, where you would use them, and uh, it's led by a slew of people who like really understand how you get the attention of your publisher or how like as a game store owner, how you get the uh, attention of a uh, distributor or anything like that. Um, so today we're gonna be talking about the soft skills of pitching. Um, my name is Anne Ratchet and my pronouns are she, Z. I use both. Uh, and I have a background in politics and am a community and social organizer in the community. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to be here. Super excited to talk about this. And my name is Emily Escobar. I um, have, I go, go by she, her, and um, I have a background in public relations, um, not necessarily in the gaming space, although I have done that for my own game um, and successfully pitched it to a publisher, but I also can't, um, you know, market other people's products, um, whether, you know, whether or not I'm the most excited about them all the time. So, you know, definitely happy to talk about my experience with that and um, how to kind of come out and put your best foot forward and try to get the results you, you want out of an interaction. So excited to, to be here as well. And so for a shorthand for what we're gonna be covering over this panel, uh, we're putting this together because sometimes things can seem a lot more complicated than they are as we go through. And it's really not complicated. What it comes down to are the two soft skills of make friends and two, do not be afraid of failure because what is a failure today might be the foundation for your success in the future. And pretty much everything we're going to be talking about is going to come back to those two key things. Emily, do you have anything to add? Uh, I would also add believing in your yourself and your product and what you've been creating, because I think that's kind of the foundation of you know, if you don't believe in it, then no one else will. So you really have to be your own best advocate. And like, to be explicit, this is a skill. It is a hard skill. And so like, you're not going to be good at it at first. It's through repetition that it's going to get easier. So a lot of it is like, first, like the first thing to get over is like, learn to confidently say, hi, my name is. That already is like such like that's your entry level bar. And we cannot underestimate like how difficult it is to just put yourself out there and say, hi, my name is. But as you get more comfortable with that, that's your foot in the door. And foot in the door is a uh, it's a sales comment, but also it's a psychological uh, commentary of it is your first step. If you have the foot in your door, everything else falls out of that. And so by being able to like put yourself out there in the first place, the rest of everything else is going to come out. Yeah. And part of what comes into that, too, is making sure that you are where the people you want to meet are as well. And unfortunately, right now that we are all online, so <laughs> you're in the right place. You're in the right place online right now. Um, if you know hopefully when the world goes back to normal at some point, you know, that means going to events like Metatopia, going to other cons, um, putting yourself, you know, not hiding in your hotel room when you have a spare moment, but get out there, go, you know, if go to, go to a restaurant, go to the bars, go, go where people are, go to the common areas, get your game out or comment on what other people are doing and just kind of get involved. Um, you know, you don't have to like, if you're not a drinker, that's fine. Still just hang out there, have a water. Um, you know, people really what the value you're going to get out of these events is those connections. So you really just have to kind of put yourself in a place where you're gonna, gonna meet people. And I know sometimes it's really intimidating. I felt super intimidated the first time I came to Metatopia because I feel like everyone else is 
friends and knew each other. And, you know, there was this like whole other like social world going on that I wasn't a part of, but, um, you know, as soon as I kind of put myself next to it and in it, um, you know, other people were friendly too. And, you know, generally people here in this industry are super nice and open. And so you're gonna, you're gonna meet people just kind of by putting yourself in, in the right place at, at the right time. So definitely don't be shy. Um, and even if you're shy, then don't be afraid to get out of your comfort zone a little bit. And I think you'll find that you'll be rewarded. So maybe that's a good starting point of like, should we talk a little bit about how to read a room and how to figure out which people to approach and start building a relationship with? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you want to kick off with that? Um, okay. So one of the big things that I notice a lot when it comes to conventions and social spaces, uh, there's two big different crowds to think about. One is going to be the uh, the major distribution floor, pretty much, where you'll have all of the stores set up. Uh, we don't necessarily see this at double exposure cons as extensively, but at major conventions, we will see that. And that is going to be your focal point for meeting people in most conventions. And then the other location is going to be the social areas outside of the main sales area. Um, and this is where you see most of the connections will be made at specifically double exposure cons or industry cons specifically. Um, so maybe a good place is to start off, like how do you know how to approach a publisher on the floor? Sure, yeah, so I think, you know, you have to keep in mind with publishers that they're there to do a lot of different things. So one of them is sell their games. Um, they're also prospecting for new games. They're also there to network and meet other people and catch up with their other publishers. Um, so if you stop by, you know, a publisher's booth and you see them running around like crazy, or maybe there's running a test play at their table and they just seem like they're super involved, obviously not a great time to jump in and say, like, hey, I want to meet you. Like, hi, my name's, you know, my name's Emily, like what's going on, you know? So you have to kind of wait for a moment when they might have some downtime. Um, part of that, part of what plays into that is understanding kind of like the um, ebb and flow of the cons in general. Like if it's a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday event, Thursday is generally the best day to go and try to make those connections because it's a slow day. A lot of people haven't come in yet from out of town. Everyone's kind of set up their booth. They're fresh. They have energy. They're a little more willing to listen than say um, a Sunday, which is the last day, which I know we're dealing with here. There's a little bit of fatigue. They just want to get out. <laughs> they, you know, it's not the best time. Everyone's exhausted. They haven't slept much. So it's kind of understanding too, like when is the point when they're going to have the most energy, you know, Friday's ramping up a little bit. Um, Saturday's usually the most insane day of, of conventions of four day conventions. So you probably, you know, Saturday will be a difficult day. It's not impossible, but there just might be a lot going on. There's a lot of the public there buying games. So, you know, you kind of have to think about that too. If it's a three-day conference, you know, it's the same sort of ebb and flow. First day is a little slow. Second day is usually pretty crazy. Third day, people are like, get me out of here. So understanding that is a, is a big piece of like, when do you approach them? And same thing with the days themselves. If you go a little earlier, you may be able to catch somebody who's a, like a little less busy and a little more open to um, hearing what you have to say. A lot of people, uh, for a lot of people, this is a part-time job. So like they can only show up to the convention on a Saturday or something like that. This is where a business card and a well-organized a well business card is going to be super important. Um, one of the best recommendations I've ever had for putting together a business, uh, like a business business card, like not for someone who knows you already, but for someone who doesn't know you, is make sure you have blank space on it so that they can write down where they met you, why they care about you, all of these things on it. Like if you have space on the card, then they'll remember you and that's where you can start building a relationship later on. Um, yeah. So like, it's not like if you can't show up early on, that's fine. Like, just know that the kind of relationship that you'll be building over the course of the weekend is going to be a little bit less. And you have to make considerations in accordance to that. 
Um, and it's not a bad thing. It's just a different way of going about it. Yeah. And the other thing I would mention is that if you think you want to pitch a game to a publisher and you've got some time on your hands, like you are maybe a year, half a year out from making that pitch itself, um, you can always try to go to just meet them first, compliment their games, play their games, um, because there's no better way to show that you really like understand and are trying to learn about a person than to be in invested in what they are. So, um, you know, my husband and I did that with, um, you know, publisher we thought might be interested in our game. We actually went to PAX East and sat down and played with him and bought a few of his games and played them at home. So there's, there's just no greater compliment. And then they will remember you if you sit down and you take the time to understand their products and, and support them um, and follow them on social media and all that stuff. So you're kind of building up to the point where you'll meet them in person. Maybe if you haven't had a time to meet them in person, but commenting on their Instagram or Facebook or engaging with them on Twitter beforehand. So they have a little bit of familiarity with who you are. Um, and also, you know, if you're comfortable putting your, your, actual face on your social media channel so that they recognize you from those interactions to when they finally meet you in person or online as we're doing now. And one of the uh, comments I really like from chat is from Tornado, which is an ash can can be an excellent business card. So make <laughs> sure you have your information on it because we want to contact you. Like that's the entire point. Like we're going to conventions and meet people and yeah, just make sure people have ways to contact you and have a way of pinpointing you because at most conventions, we're meeting at least dozens of people, if not hundreds of people. So it's hard to keep everyone straight. It's not that you're not memorable. It's just the industry is full of so many great memorable people. We want to remember everyone. And uh, yes, from uh, Craig Maloney 242, Make sure it's current information, like keep updating your information. Um, so I think we've said a little bit enough about the con floor in general. Uh, let's talk about the more fun social interactions. Like how do you read a, like a bar con floor? Um, and one of the things that I really point out is when people are meeting people for the first time entering in, we always think about big names and trying to meet the Jason Morningstars because I'm in indie RPGs, uh, the Meg Bakers, um, the Rob Donahues, like that's who everyone is focused on meeting. And those are great people, but also everybody is targeting their attention. So in the long run, they're not necessarily going to be your most important contacts. So I really like pointing um, like see those people, introduce yourself, start building those relationships, but like know that like don't expect too much out of them. The hi, my name is. And if the conversation follows, great. Otherwise, give them space because it's very easy to be overloaded when people expect a lot from you at a con. Instead, look to the people who are sitting in groups of like three or four. Um, specifically at Metatopia, it is easy to find these people because there tends to be an extra chair policy that as a chair gets filled, another chair gets put down, meaning we want to talk to you. Like that's the entire point of Barcon is we want to get to know you. And it's super like it's in those small groups. Um, you can start like building what I find are the more valuable relationships in the long run because everyone knows someone like everybody is friends with someone and you never know what contact is going to be the contact you're looking for later down the line. Yeah, I also agree with that. And I think um, it's important not to get too stuck into the, I'm um, working on RPG starting to talk to tabletop people and vice versa. Um, you know, I made a really good contact through somebody who does RPGs and I don't do RPGs, but he was friends with a, you know, guys very well connected in the tabletop industry um, and introduced us. So you just like never know where, where a great connection is going to come from. Um, and I'd say also just, you know, as you're having these conversations, making sure that you're getting people's contact information and following up with a quick email afterwards, say, Hey, it was great to meet you. So excited, you know, like, let me know where I can follow you on, you know, all, on your projects and just, 
keeping them up to checking in on their projects. What are they working on? How's it going? Um, because you know those are those are relationships they'll continue to foster over the years, and it's really exciting to see where everyone goes from there. Like again, we I, I'm going to keep saying this. Like your goal is to make friends. Like yes, the pitch is important, but as was mentioned on the pitch perfect discussion, it's a discussion. It is a conversation. It's really important that during pitches you give people an opportunity for an out which means like if you don't do something to like peer pressure them into like no you need to listen now it means you can do your pitch later down the line like next week after the con is over you can also do the pitch that's fine it's probably better to do the pitch not at the actual con honestly in a lot of ways because like there's just so much stimulus they might not remember it might be a great pitch but like there's just too much going on it's easy to forget um and when you're like building that it's like hi my name is i hear you're interested in this that is also important for your pitch because you can then start tailoring what you're going to present based on what their interests are and you might also know that this person is not actually good for me to pitch to because their interests and what they do is far enough from my own game that i'm going to now use them for a networking source because at the root of it, pitching is a subset of a networking specialty. Yeah, and you never know. Publishers are really generous. And if, if it's not a fit for them, they would be like, well, go talk to this person because I think it's really more their speed. So they might actually point you in a different direction, you know, in a friendly way. So it's always it's always good to have those conversations. Um, but I, I would say too, um, if mm -hmm. you are pitching cold at a convention, you just you go in there and you're you're gonna you're gonna do it. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say like take. We when I pitched my board game, um, we got no from somebody else at the company initially. Um, they weren't the head person; they were one of the gatekeepers. Um, they said no, but we went ahead and kind of grabbed the head publisher and said, "Hey, like." She actually noticed our shirts. We had like our branding on our shirts, which is a good way also to start conversations, just like have something, wear something fun, wear something different. That's another point. But, um, you know, we, we, we kind of caught our attention with that and said, hey, like we have a game. Can we pitch it to you? And she said, yes, like pulled us behind, you know, a curtain into the back. And we sat down and we played it out really quick. Um, so, you know, I would say that you don't have to necessarily take no from one person as the end all be all. Um, you know, if you really think it's a fit, you can still you know, try to make those connections with somebody else at the company because you never know if it, you know, if one person says no, there might be a, like a window open over there. So, you know, if, if you do end up going that route, just know that there are sometimes other ways in if you just are a little bit um, persistent, but not annoyingly. So if they are clearly busy and they say, no, not right now, like don't, you know, don't keep hammering on them. But, you know, just like <laughs> to what we've been talking about, it's kind of about reading them. And if they've kind of shown a little interest or they're kind of open to having the conversation with you, then absolutely, um, you know, go in there and pursue it. From Chernado, um, which is uh, as someone who's being pitched to what are some of the best ways to make it easier for people to come forward? Um, I think to what I said earlier, having like an interesting kind of opening line, if you will, or a way to make yourself stand out. I know a lot of people, uh, you know, it's if whether it's like a fun hat or something just to make easy conversation i think that always opens the door a little bit is like when you can make a comment about about something you have in common um so you know thinking of a fun way i was like the exploding kittens booth at gen con like they always like hand out funny props if you stand in line there for a dollar you get like something funny from there so like carrying that funny little object around just might be like an icebreaker enough to to start a conversation um so finding little ways in like that um, for me, I take some of the body language elements out of stage. Um, in theater, uh, one of the things that is used is called the stage whisper, where specifically you're talking to someone, but you're angling your body out to the audience so that the audience is welcomed into the conversation that you're having. 
this is one of like the skills that I use consistently in order to like, even while standing, have the chair open policy is make it sure that like, if you aren't in a private discussion, you have your body language open. So there's a clear space for a third or fourth person to enter in as well and be like, hi, my name is. And from there, like, you'll find that pretty readily, if you have the space available for someone to invite themselves, they're going to come invite themselves. Um, the other thing I think is useful as someone who gets pitched to and you want people to pitch to you um, would be just don't, like it can be hard if you are like surrounded by a large group of people because uh, one of the things we see form are referred to as courts, where one person tends to be the center of focus and everyone is like trying to get something out of that relationship. Um, courts are interesting dynamics that you see, but they also can be really hard to be inclusive. So by trying to focus on having like conversations with no more than five people so that people don't feel stimulated or feel like they're like interrupting something big to get your attention. Like that can also help make it a little bit easier. Um, and one of the comments is everyone has social anxiety, which may or may not actually be true, but the practical reality is like a lot of the time it is. So I think it's also like, if you go out and you start making those relationships yourself, even as a publisher, like it might sound a little silly, it might sound a little bit reverse, like maybe not necessarily your goal, but sometimes I've, like, I've heard from quite a few people who attend the con, they get intimidated, they don't wanna interrupt something, um, they feel like people are busy and maybe they don't wanna talk to them. And so by flipping it on the head and taking that initiative, like, to go out and say, hi, my name is, and I'm a publisher. You can then like introduce and like make it a little bit easier. Uh, it's not necessarily easy for an introvert, but no con is an easy area for an introvert. So it's figuring out that balance of like, what level of self care do I need? And what, how much do I wanna be invested in this welcoming environment? because the culture is what we make of it and what we do to enforce the environment around us. I've also found it a lot easier to approach publishers if they're doing a play test or something and they have kind of an open table with seats available. So that's a great way to draw people in so they don't feel, you know, so intimidated and they have a game to play. So it's not like they're sitting down and pitching you, they're just sitting down to play a game with you and maybe that comes up in conversation. Yeah, I can like, I'm thinking back to uh, Last Dreamation where after a LARP, uh, there was like just yarn all over the bar that people were untangling. And that became a major social icebreaker where it's like, hi, I'm gonna sit here and untangle yarn. And I'm also gonna talk to people while I'm here doing this other activity. So having a shared activity, like super easy way to create an icebreaker. Um, so, so we've had uh, a little bit of a talk about structured business cards, but we've had like the request to lay it out a little bit more. Um, so I think part of like having a good business card is going to depend on one person forces another, like what you're going out of it. Um, in my case, like I don't have the perfect business card because my business cards don't tell you what I do. That is intentional. If I have to tell you what I do, I personally like that's not the relationships that I built. Um, but what I can say is like the general layout is here's what most people recommend. I mean, some people say it's leaving out the egg, but in my case, like specifically from the skill sets that I do, like if we don't have a relationship outside that you remember, like I can't particularly help you. I also fill a weird niche within the gaming industry. Like I don't tip fall into the typical game designer versus like editor or anything like that. So like my skill set is weird. If you're, I can only speak to this from a game 
game designer perspective. But um, what I did, I initially ordered just some, you know, very basic um, business cards that had my name, phone number, email, you know, to Twitter, Instagram, all that on it, uh, my handles on it. Um, and that was really, I, I found that I just like didn't enjoy giving it out because I wasn't super excited about it. Um, but what I ended up doing was what was, um, you know, when I got a little more budget to play with, um, I created playing card business cards that had my game characters on them. And each one was a little bit different. Like I printed out, I used like playingcards.com to print out different characters from my game. And then the back had all my information on it. Um, and it was like super slick looking. It was super fun to hand out. People got to choose the character that they liked that, that that most resonated with them. So that was a really fun way to engage people with the game itself and be like, yeah, these are like what you would play with, you know, when the game's published and what it looks good, this is how the cards are going to look. So it also gave them a preview of, you know, with, this is what hopefully the final version of the game will look like. So, um, you know, and it's a little more expensive to, um, you know, print playing cards for your business cards. But I would say that in terms of like a marketing strategy, it was worth every penny we spent on them because we had people, you know, coming, <laughs> wanting to get our business cards, like who wants to take business cards? So, um, you know, just think about things like that, that you can do to make them a little more fun, a little more interactive um, and just, and just more personalized. I think um, if my voice will activate, there we go. Uh, the other thing is I really, push for accessibility when it comes to business cards. You wanna make sure the font is legible. You wanna make sure there's a distinct contrast between what the color of your ink is versus the background. Um, you want it to, like as mentioned, like it's good to have it memorable in one way. Um, so I highly recommend getting a professional designer to do your business cards and not to do them yourself, like unless you are an artist because you can get these people at very reasonable rates. I got mine done for multiple passes, uh, $65 total, uh, like incredible rate personally from like two, like I had five samples to work off of. And um, like, it really pays off. Like this is your representation you are putting out into the world. So you wanna make sure like it is as easy to use as possible. Um, I've also seen people that like, as they do more and more, they've done double decker business cards. Um, that's the other things like make sure it's a business card shaped business card, because when things are oddly shaped, they don't stack well together. And when you're getting lots of business cards, like that becomes the odd egg out and not in a good way because it doesn't fit. It's kind of awkward. It's easy to lose. And it's, for a lot of people, like what they want is something that is easy to go through after the con. Um, so as for QR card codes, um, I think that's up to you. Like if you have a localized place where all of your work can be seen, that can be a super easy way for people to like recognize you. Um, like I don't, I don't see why not. Just make sure that uh, you have the availability of, um, what's it called? Uh, there's still space for people to write on the business card. And like, I said this like write with business card, but like pencil should work. So I do not recommend laminating your business cards or having it have a glossy finish because that prevents pencil from writing on them, which you don't know what a person will have to write with. So having it be a matte finish instead tends to be a lot more accessible. Okay, so we touched on this a little bit, but it's we're now about halfway, so let's flesh it out a little bit. Let's talk about like how to use failure to your benefit. So, as I said, like, as we've said so far, like so much about this is building relationship, knowing how to approach the relationship um, and knowing that it's not a one time thing. Um, like the email you send after the fact is going to have a lot of weight. So when we're dealing with failure. Again, it's about keeping the door open, like taking the failure gracefully. 
as Emily said, like one failure at the same company turned out as into a success at the same company because they didn't hammer a single relationship. Like it kept the door open and didn't burn that bridge. And like companies do talk. Um, so I think one of my favorite examples I've heard recently is a friend went into a game store and was like, hi, I want to sell my game and found out that the person who actually does the sales for the shop wasn't there. So what was the response? For a lot of people, they would have been like, oh, I can't do what I want to do here, so I'm gonna leave. Instead, what he did was he turned around and was like, oh, hi, person at the desk, do you wanna see a game? And that actually turned into a sale right then and there because the person was so excited about the game. And what's important about that is that person at the desk is then going to talk about said game at that store, which creates a foot in the door to have that relationship that was sought after in the first place. So it seems like a failure just because like the end goal couldn't be reached, but it leads to a success, like a direct path to success. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and even if you get a no from a particular person or store or whatever, um, at that moment, maybe it's a no, but you may work on something in the future that fits their style a little bit more. And so having that relationship built up a little bit, at least just a familiarity, they know your name, they know who you are, um, makes it a lot easier to approach them in the future and say like, hey, I actually think this thing might be more what you're looking for. So, um, you know, it's it's totally fine. It never, um, you know, I would say just like, don't get mad or upset if somebody says like, oh. says no to it at that time, you know, it's, you just, you just never know. Um, and people move around, they change jobs. So maybe they're doing this one role at this one publishing company, they go to another one and it's a better fit for them. So just like, don't get, don't take it personally. It's not, a, it's never about you as a person. It's, you know, it's just like, what what is, their current environment like what are they looking for at the moment maybe they're all full for the year maybe they've got all, all the games that they want to create for that year set and guess what it just like the timing didn't work out so just like never let it get to you to the point where you're like i'm never going to talk to that person again or i'm never going to pitch that company again um you know have grace with it and send the follow-up email say thank you so much for your time really appreciate it i'll stay in touch um you know best of luck with with everything going on you know just like just kind of continue to send them the positive vibes because you will, you know, it, it inevitably will come back to you, whatever you put out there. So if you just kind of shut down with that relationship, then they might shut down with you as well. So, yeah. So important. Again, like reiterating, you never know why the person is saying no. There's lots and lots of people in the industry who are publishers who reject games that they love simply because it's not what they're looking for in the moment. Mm -hmm. And they still love the game. Uh, there are two big things that people are looking for uh, in the gaming industry for when they are uh, looking for people to like bring on. One, are they my friend? Which tends to be a lot of the time. Like if there's your friend, you're gonna come up, people are gonna think of you and your skill set. So again, why you want to build those relationships is so that people think of you. And two, the more important aspect, are you easy to work with? If you take no well, you are easy to work with. So in the future, they're more likely to say yes, because they know that you're not going to like turn it into something it's not. Yeah. And like, no one in the gaming industry likes to say no. We want to say yes, because we're all excited about games. Like, they want to say yes. So make it easy for them to say yes. Make it easy for them to say no. It's the same side of the coin. Or, sorry, it's two sides of the same coin. Yeah, and along the same lines, if they do ask for something, if they ask for, um, you know, a, a copy of your game or, you know, stats about it, whatever, you know, be quick with it. Don't, don't sit on that forever. Just like you want to demonstrate that you can, you are uh, to the point of being easy to work with that it doesn't take you two weeks to send it to, or if you, if it does, you have a reason to say, I got this test play feedback. I'm incorporating it. I'm just like tweaking things and just like, let them know where you are with the game or whatever you're working on and be really clear in your, in your communication and just like give them updates. Don't disappear. And then be like, 
Hey, I got it a month later. That's just, you know, not good relationship building. So um, being transparent about where you are um, goes a long ways and, and just being very, um, you know, kind of thinking about this is a business they're running. So, you know, they don't want you to fall off the radar completely if they're interested in something. So um, just being super clear with them and regular in your communications with them. So at this point, uh, if there's any more questions, we will gladly be taking them because we've covered the bulk of what we originally walked into. <laughs> um, and if not, we're going to talk a little bit more about how to turn a friendship into an actual pitch. So let's do that. So. When dealing with a relationship, uh, here's a question. Um, how do you handle when a pitch is interrupted and throws you off your game? Yeah, that happens a lot. So, uh, oh, I think Anne just, oh, we're having some type of. Yep, Discord. Sorry. There different. we go. <laughs> yep. Apologies for that. that Doing the best with what technology we have. The perfect way to seg segue into that that question. <laughs> and like pretty much like that, like mm -hmm. you take it lightheartedly. You don't take it too seriously. You just keep going with what you have. And if your pitch gets interrupted, as we said again, like earlier, it, just consider it a failure. Like, oh no, I didn't do the thing. It means I'm going to have to try again later. Like it, it doesn't mean particularly much. Um, and I, it is difficult because when you're pitching, you are very vulnerable. Um, so I think part of it is learning to just be graceful with your own self, if that makes sense. Like you are doing a hard thing but it doesn't have to have that much weight on you. Like, yeah, just, I, yeah, go ahead. I agree. Um, you know, it's, it's okay to also take a moment to collect yourself and say, hold on, I, you know, I need a minute and just pause and get your thoughts together because you're human and everybody understands that. And, you know, I'm sure they know that you had this whole thing planned and you didn't expect this interruption. So it's okay to like get your thoughts together, sit back down, kind of recap where you were and then move on. So, you know, it's, it's acknowledge it. It's fine. It's not gonna, it's not gonna ruin your pitch to, to, and it also to the point of being easy to work with, you know, if, if something comes up and the publisher has to run and take care of emergency um, to have the grace to be like, great. Yeah. Do what you need to do. You're showing that you're flexible. You can go with the flow that you're, you can, you can, um, you can deal with it and you're not going to be high maintenance or have a breakdown or, you know, or, or be upset about it. So it just kind of rolls, shows you can roll with the punches. Oh, going into like, how do you turn a friendship into a pitch? Um, with everything, like, again, this is a relationship. Like, it's a two-way street. So it's easier to approach your friend, say, hey, here's the thing I've been working on. Um, one of the things I find is, like, it's difficult in games is people have less experience with walking the relationship between friendship and business. And these two things can't be conflated because a work relationship has a different structure than a friendship that you see every single day. And keeping in mind that like a publisher or a like game designer who is doing their own Kickstarter or anything like that, they have lots of reasons for why they're choosing to work with the people that they do. It's totally fine to be like, hey, I'm super excited about your project and I'd like to help with it. But like if they reject you, it's not a reflection on you or your relationship. It's a relation, like it has to do with something in a much bigger picture. Um, so like that's one of the ways I've seen it is like, hey, either a person has reached out, like I know your work because you're my friend 
and I'd like to work with you. I think you'd be a good fit for this project. And that way you don't even have to pitch. Like you're being welcomed in just because you have the relationship, which helps making the pitching a little bit easier because again, it never really happened. It just like naturally went into one direction. But the other way is like, because you are friends, like just gently approaching and saying, I want to work on your project, or I'd like you to do this thing um, in order to like make my game a reality. Like one, you know, when is the right time to approach them? Because like your friends, you know how to read their body language better, uh, or you know you're not at a con, so they're not overwhelmed. Um, or you have an idea of like what's going on in their life. So like maybe they're having huge relationship drama one week, you know that's not the week to approach because they're dealing with other stuff. And it allows you to have more opportunities to like have it at the right time, have the like, because so much of the pitch is the timing of the pitch. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's also just a matter of, you know, if you're trying to establish that friendship, again, give to them before you take, that's always the number one way, support them, support their games, support, you know, even if you're not, you can't buy them for whatever reason, like you have too many games already, but, you know, support them on the social media, comment, you know, contribute. Um, if they have like a newsletter, subscribe to it. Um, just make sure that you're really like up on what's going on in their world and making sure that you're kind of cheerleading them along the way because they will remember you over the person who has never talked to them before and then suddenly approaches them with a game idea. Mm -hmm. So we have a question. Is it cheating to ask a friend what they look for in the pitch? And no, it is not. That's why they're their friend. Like that's the reason why you build the relationship is so that you can take care of a lot of the complications that come with the pitch and make it an easy relationship. Like, why not? Again, they're your friend, they want to say yes. So making it easy for them to say yes is part of the relationship and part of what's so great. Anything to add? I think you summed it up perfectly. <laughs> So yeah, uh, so we talked about, this is usually why I make notes for panels, which for some reason I didn't for this one. <laughs> I am yeah. guilty as well, so don't that. Um, let's see, I, I think one thing I do wanna talk about is just the confidence piece of it. Um, if you are pitching a game that's maybe maybe it's not totally finished yet or you know there's things that need to be worked on you don't have to don't beat your own game up you are your game's cheerleader you were you always make sure that you're just like super excited and positive about your game and you're pitching it because if you have any insecurities um about it and you those will kind of bubble up to the surface so um you know don't try not to say them out loud um if there's things that are you know gameplay things that you need to figure out you could say something like I'm working on this, but you know, it's like, it's in progress. So ignore that because these other things are amazing and it's all coming together. So, you know, I, I think you just need to be so, try to be, um, you know, pretty excited about your game when you come to the table. Cause if you're not, then nobody else will be. So, um, you know, just, just selling that confidence. Um, the confidence will sell the game in itself of itself. Um, I think I mentioned that I, I work in PR and there's sometimes when I'm like, I am not excited about this, this, product and that's you know when i'm in that mentality uh is not the time for me to be pitching it even writing a pitch about it because that will come through in my writing so you know what i have to do is kind of get my mind around like what is what is different about this product what's exciting about this product why is it better than the other products that are like it out there um, and really kind of pump yourself up with those kinds of details um that's again for selling things that you know i've had to sell like kitchen sink sponges so not exciting. So, but you know, you, you have to do what you have to do sometimes. So with your game, hopefully you are excited about that. Don't be afraid to let that excitement and positivity shine through in your pitch. So uh, our last question that we're going to be fielding today is how should the maturity of my game impact my pitching? And I don't think there's a clean answer to that because it really depends on the game. 
Do you have any comments? What, what do you mean by maturity? Sorry. So uh, depending on the game, like it might have been sitting on the shelf for a while, or you might have been working on it for a long period of time. But for some reason, it's not like bright, brand new and shiny. Got it. I think it, again, like you have to get your hands back on that game before you pitch it and get excited about it again. It's play testing it a little bit more, um, kind of brushing it up. Um, you know, again, if you're not excited about it, no one else will be. So, you know, find the thing that made you excited about the game in the first place before you go to a publisher and, and try to sell it um, to them. Because, you know, if, if you're not thinking it's fresh and new, then they're not going to also pursue it or perceive it as fresh and new. Um, and if you have already pitched it, say before, and you've changed it a up a little bit, and now you're bringing it to them up to them again, um, really play up what's new, different about it this time that you're pitching it and why it's going to work better for them this time. And there's a lot of reasons why a game might have been sitting on the shelf for a while. I know Julia Bon Ellingbo has been in the recent years working on a game that's been sitting on the shelf for 10 years. Like, Mm -hmm. Everything has its time and its place. Um, like currently, people have been working on pandemic games. Now is not the time to pitch them. Like it's going to be a couple of years until you pitch them. Um, so again, like as touched on, sometimes the game might have been pitched before and figuring out why it hasn't been pitched. Um, I play tested a game that was pretty much complete. But the difficulty with it is it had too many pieces and too much like maintenance involved. So despite being a game that was complete and felt good, there wasn't like an easy way as a player to make sure you're doing everything right because there were just so many nitpicky pieces. And so the question became, is this proper for a board game or should it really be a video game? because then a computer can take care of all of the uh, cleanup and the background work in order to make the game viable, even if it was designed as a board game. Um, in other cases, like maybe the game wasn't ready. Like I, we were talking about this in the chat recently, uh, like uh, Metatopia channel that a lot of people will bring to Metatopia a game they call Invada, when truly it's an alpha and needs to be talked more about what's going on. And there are definitely difficulties with games that stem from having not taken enough time to brainstorm the foundational idea before bringing it to completion. And that's where you start to see a lot of like difficulty if the idea wasn't really solid, if it didn't truly know itself, then you can end up like being stuck with a game that isn't complete, like it isn't quite itself. And then that's one of the ways you can add maturity to a game in not a positive way versus you can turn it into positive of I was waiting for the idea to be complete. So there mm -hmm. are elements of a dated time, but the game truly knows itself. And there's a lot of power in a game that truly knows itself and is followed through in every single level. Like, it's a complete experience, even if it's not a modern experience. It's part of the reason why the Dude board game has been out for, like, over two decades. And it is still active in conversation because the game knew itself and it does exactly what it does fantastically. So it lives outside of time, pretty much, because it can be used as a good example of how to do asynchronous play. Um, so also being directed, at what point do I know my idea is far enough along to pitch it? I think it depends. Um, like I'm thinking to, again, the Pitch Perfect panel, uh, some people came up with the idea of uh, Cinder, which is a dragon dating game. And immediately as they loved the idea, before they had a game or anything, they were like, hey, does that, or, hey uh, Smirk and Dagger, Here's my pitch for this game that I haven't written yet. Like, it's not ready then. Like, yeah. it can be a fantastic idea. Don't, don't pitch it then. Like, make sure you actually have a game. Um, mm -hmm. I think it also slightly depends if you're in the board game arena or if you're in the RPG arena. Um, in my experience with board games, uh, 
there's less finicking about the details of what's the content of the game. Like either it's a good fit for the line or it's not a good fit for the line. Mm -hmm. um, with RPGs, I've seen people where they actually alter stuff inside the content of the game in order to make it match to a line or to like a publisher specific requirements or things like that. So um, with an RPG, probably you would want to pitch it a little bit earlier on if you do pitch it so that there's still that wiggle room in order to make it fit to a line versus with a board game, there's a certain point where you're just making a different game. And it's not worth making a game to fit to a specific line. Yeah, I would say also with your test play, that's where this really comes in. Um, I think personally, there was a point where I was working on this game um, and it was just kind of like the same thing over and over again to the point of maturity before where I was like bringing the same game to test plays to conventions. And I was seeing like an average level, like an okay level of excitement. It wasn't like people were dragging their friends over to play the game. And I knew that there were parts of it that like needed to be fixed. Um, and then once I kind of had this eureka moment from a test play session feedback and fixed this one mechanic, um, it totally changed the game. And I did have that really big excitement where people were like, when is this coming out? Can I, you know, can I bring my friends over to play it? When you see that kind of excitement where people are grabbing people, like you got to get in on this. This is, this is really fun. That's, I think that's kind of when you know that you're, you're there. Um, and when the mechanics run smoothly enough that, you know, you're not running into issues with people saying this is broken, that's broken. This doesn't work well. So you'll kind of know when it's really finesse. And that's the point where you want to maybe think about bringing it to a publisher is, is the excitement level for one. And then the two, the, um, the mechanics are really rock solid. There aren't many ways to break the game anymore. Um, and it's really in that kind of final form. Sorry, I can only speak to tabletop. I don't have RPGs. <laughs> yeah. And part of it is like, there is generally less pitching when it comes in the RPG arena because so many people kickstart. There's definitely like specific areas. So like Magpie is known for being PBTA or powered by the apocalypse. It's a specific uh, dice rolling system and a set of expectations out of the play style. So like in that case, if you're pitching to Magpie something that isn't PBTA, it's probably not going to work. Even with that, like they're very specific about the games they put on their uh, their docket. So like it's a RPG pitching is kind of complicated. Um, but yeah, I think it was like as stated, like you want to get it solid enough that you know what the game is, but it doesn't have to be complete. There are still things you can be working on. It's fine to pitch a little bit early on, um, but the game itself needs to be able to still shine on some level and stand out from the crowd because there is thousands of games that are written every year that you're competing against. And so it's a question of how is this one different? How does it stand out? Why do I care about this one over a different game? And like, what I usually say is like, does it actually go to like the extreme? Does the, do the mechanics do the extent of what the mechanic can do? Um, and that can take some fine finessing. Um, I've seen playtesting for games that are like been pitched and stuff like that, like they're done almost, but there's still nitpicky work going on in order to make it run a little bit smoother. That can be done by like playtesting four games actively at the same time and seeing how people are interacting with it from like that mass level. Like, is there a singular point? And so that sounds nitpicky. I know a lot of game designers who don't do that kind of nitpicky game design, like detail work, but like you still do it. Um, I would say like, if you're at a point where like the game doesn't know what it is, for example, uh, if you're somewhere between a board game or a story game and you're not sure where you're going with it yet, don't go to publisher, like make sure the game knows what it is first. Do we have any last comments? Okay, so we are out of time. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Ann Ratchet. You can find me 
at uh, at Twitter under slash MNGWA under slash. Um, and you can also find me in the Discord. And I'm Emily Escobar. You can find me at Emily Escobar on Twitter. It's V, not B, it's like Pablo Escobar. <laughs> so V is in Victor in my last name. Thank you everyone for joining us. So, if anybody has any comments they would like to talk to us about, please join us in the, uh, the channel uh, watch party and have a great rest of your con. Thank you.